Hi. Hello. Oops. Hi. Hi, Emma. Hi. Sorry. Sorry. I was just trying to get off another call. Oh, no, oh. don't worry, Corey. I'll be on two other Zoom contours today, so it's fine. Well, I had to go into the city for a meeting and it just completely actually disrupted the productivity of my day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I end up doing calls on the phone that would have been much better doing on the laptop and all the rest. Yeah. So where, where are you, Emma? I live in Rockdale. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And I, I work um, in the city, in Pitt Street. Oh, okay. But we're working from home primarily. But every now and again, you know, people like to have something face-to-face. -face. Yep. Yeah, mm. so that's what my son's doing today. He's going into work. Is he? What does he do? Uh, he works at Future Super, where, oh. they, don't, where they don't divest, or well, they don't invest They've in divest. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. know Future Super. Yeah. I'm on a superannuation board myself. Yeah? Mm. Okay. Illegal super. Oh, okay. Mm. Anyway. So, now, um, mm. God, no, what happened was my um, PowerPoint shorted. That's what happened. Ah. Uh. The modem. So, I had to flick it off. I think it was the kettle. Oh, that's yeah. not good though. But you might want to get an electrician out to just double. Oh, no, no. I think I'll just get rid of the kettle. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That also works. <laughs> <laughs> so I've jiggled out around the, uh, the uh, talk a little bit. Mm -hmm. So now, okay, I'll just exit full screen. We might. Uh, I want to get rid of me. Yeah. Uh, you work it out. Take your time. I'll just take me off. I'm just kind of not sure what. Um, where am I? Um, just clicking here. Hide non-video participants. There we go. Woohoo! Uh, <laughs> just in because I mean, really, we just want your face. Oops, no, don't want to do that. That's why I shut my slides. Out. So I can have my face up the top corner somewhere in the slides uh, PowerPoint. Hmm. Why don't you just start? And if it doesn't look right, I'll just stop you. Oh, yeah, it's fine. It's easy just with one person anyway. Okay, mm. so we'll go PowerPoint. Okay, and I shall go present and go backwards. No, keep sliding forward. It's not supposed to go forward that way. Hang on. It's going forward by itself. Escape. <laughs> so I can't see your screen yet either. You can't see it? No. Okay, let me just say, uh, I think I have to share my screen. You do. Okay, so I'll go back to here. I'll go down here and share screen. Okay. Now, so we'll go, oh, my screen's very messy. I might just get rid of a few Zooms. I don't know what happened there. I was on a, a Zoom with someone this morning. They shared their screen and they said, oops, I see you can see I'm searching for women's woolen clothing. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the other oh, times she so had funny. opened. Okay. Luckily, it was not C-rated. <laughs> so funny. Okay. So if I sh – okay, I'll try sharing my screen again. And I – yes, I – all my other things are on. So if, can I just do that screen? Oh, yeah. That looks good. Now. Uh, except for all I can see is Zoom. Yeah, okay. If I do that. Can you yeah. See? Yep. But then if you go into, yep, perfect. And I can see you in the top right-hand corner okay. too. Good. All right. So I'm not going to interrupt you. Okay. You're just going to pretend that there's a room of people. Yes. And, uh, and I'm just going to yep. mute me. Okay. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this. I'm Dr. King Lu, and I live and work in the land of the Darug Nation. This is me at work at Bristol, and these are my kids, Alex and Sydney, and this is where I work. And you can see it's sustainable with solar panels on the roof. It also has a battery to back up the... Um, our generators and our vaccines. I'm currently the acting chair of Doctors for the Environment and I'm with the Climate and Health Alliance, Australian Medical Association, Citizens Climate Lobby and Australian Parents for Climate Action. I have spent most of my time in the last three months, like all other doctors in Australia, 
dealing with the corona crisis. This is me prepping before I was doing a swab for a patient. This is, has been a major crisis that's disrupted our life and, and the way we relate to our family. But the bigger crisis that we're going to face in the future is climate change. Although climate change is not as sudden as the coronavirus, we're feeling the effects of it now. It's no longer theoretical in Australia. And the Lancet Countdown, which is a very prestigious journal in the UK, has said that this is the biggest global health challenge in the 21st century. So what keeps us healthy? So these are the determinants of human health. We need clean air, clean water, healthy soils, a stable climate, and diverse diversity of plants and animals. We don't have clean air in Australia. We have cars that have products that make our kids sick and give increases the chances of asthma. We have good solid studies that relate asthma with car pollutants for children. We have 3,000 people who die each year from air pollution, from heart attacks, lung disease and cancers. Water, we've had a crisis of water with a prolonged drought in New South Wales. We've had towns like Tamworth run out of water. And we know that water is contaminated processing fossil fuels. Coal and gas require water in its processing in it, and it also contaminates it once it's finished with it. Our soils have been damaged during our prolonged drought. The Large-scale agriculture using so, uh, fertilisers made from fossil fuels has decimated the quality of our soils. And we haven't had a stable climate. And our plants and animals have been decimated even prior to the bushfires. The Lancet Countdown tracks the progress of health and climate change. Climate change threatens to undo the past 50 years of public health gains. We know that rising temperatures lead to falls in productivity and has driven over a million people worldwide out of work. 150 million people each year are exposed to heat waves. And undernutrition is a significant health impact with a rise in temperatures, with 6% fall in wheat yields and 10% falls in rice yields. And air pollution from burning fossil fuels has led up to 4 million people to die prematurely around the world. Air pollution in Australia, like I said before, 3,000 people die each year. And this is from the government's own data from the Australian Health and Welfare Institute. We know that 279 people each year die in New South Wales from generating energy from black coal. The estimated cost each year is 11 to $24 million. And the, currently the community and the health sector bear the costs of burning fossil fuels, not the polluters. And we know the level of air um, the pollution in, in New South Wales because we have over 80 ambient air quality monitors. And heat waves, which are the silent killer. And we know that currently the length, extent and severity of heat waves are unprecedented in the past few years. And climate change increases heat waves, hot days, and the risk of bushfires. And we know that more people in Australia have died from heat waves than a combination of all natural disasters combined. And this year we've had the Black Summer, a catastrophic bushfires that started in winter. And this has been traumatic for so many people with 3,000 people hospitalised for respiratory and cardiac problems, 33 people dying directly from the fires, four people dying linked to the fires. And my patients suffered 80 days of toxic smoke and this affected 8 million people. There's a loss of 3 million animals. There were 3,000 homes destroyed and 1.2 million hectares destroyed. This is a picture from my friend's front porch during the bushfire on the south coast. All of these are her photos. 
these are her and her friends watching the bushfires, progressively getting worse. And this is her and her friends on the beach, surrounded by smoke and heat. It was terrifying for them. And we know that in order for our, our, my patients to actually survive during heat waves and bushfires, they need to understand what might happen to them. There's a study called the Adaptation for Rising Temperatures Study, which was done at the end of 2018 by the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative. And um, what they did was they looked at households and businesses in Western Sydney and the North Coast. They looked at 250 households and 60 businesses. 45% of those at risk did not heed health warnings, including the sick and the vulnerable. And 20% did not turn on their air conditioners because of the cost of electricity. Clearly, we need to train our populations to understand what could be at risk for them from now on. Now, this is my patient, Chuck, and this is his story. It's personal stories that actually convey the devastation of climate change, not data. And I've told Chuck's story on several occasions, and now his story is also documented in a book. I know Chuck for 14 years. He was my patient. And he had heart disease, lung disease, carry around an oxygen extractor and he was during heat waves we, my, his family and I always told him to stay indoors because he had, was at risk of dying from a heart attack during a heat wave and it was during December that during a 40 degree heat wave and a really highly polluted day He'd left his home twice that day. And in the afternoon, he, he, was, he, he would move around in a scooter. So he was riding his scooter out and in. And you know, with scooters, you're not protected from any, like a car, you're exposed to the heat. So on his second trip home, he was exhausted and he died on his kitchen floor. And this was a Saturday afternoon. And it was devastating for me to, the police called me to see him. And it was de devastating for me to see him. His family were there, his daughter, uh, her husband and the grandchild. And, um, and he died during the heat wave. And I'm certain if it wasn't so hot that day and he'd gone out, he wouldn't have died. And this is Jody's story. Jodie's only been my patient for two years and it was her second pregnancy which was confirmed in November. During the pregnancy, she was exposed to the toxic smoke for the months that we were exposed to 80 days of toxic smoke. Her baby was growing slowly and now her baby's been born and it's only 1.9 kilos. At the time, she had had studies done for um, genetic disorders and infections. And at this point in time, it's thought that it's possible that the 80 days of smoke impact on her growth of her babies. We know from very solid studies of particulate air pollution, the, most, the largest study being in Beijing during the Olympics, where they stopped heavy industry during the months, the three months of the Olymp prior to the Olympics. So there were cars were stopped from going into the city. All industries were stopped, and air pollution was the air was the cleanest it had been. And in that study, it showed that women who were exposed to cleaner air in the last two months of their pregnancies had heavier babies, and they had ninety thousand babies in that study. And we know that with the rising crisis that we have, that we could have bushfires. We are at increased risk of having bushfires in years to come. Unless we do something about the way we transport and what we use as fuel, the risk is that every single, the children in the future might have their, from the point of conception, have their life determined by climate change at every point. 
and we do not want that to happen. Now, these are the medical organisations that have declared a climate emergency. The health sector understands that climate change is the greatest risk to our health. And yet our politicians and the bulk of our population don't understand it. So this is 12 months ago when the Australian Medical Association, the Australian College of Emergency Medicine, Rural and Remote Medicine, Physicians, Public Health, General Practice nurse, Nurses, and Obstetricians and Gynecologists and Psychiatrists actually declared that was a climate health emergency. We actually publicised this and to the politicians and to the media. And the outcome was that nothing much changed. So what can we do to actually save our future and, do for, and have effective policies for climate action? Every conversation counts. This is a photo of my chickens and uh, I've used it in numerous talks now. This is me when I was little. I grew up in a Buddhist family and we were t I was taught at a young age that everything on this earth is valuable and cannot be harmed. And I've lived a life where I've had a low carbon footprint for most of my life. My parents grew vegetables and had fruit trees. I have vegetables and fruit trees, I have chickens. And I also had the solar panels and I bought a battery and I had a very low power bill. And this is the picture of the beginnings of my food forest where I planted seven new trees. Once I actually had my carbon footprint very low, it was pointless just me knowing about it. In order to influence other people, you actually have to publicise. So I went out there and rang pretty much every single paper to see who would actually listen and show that it, had to have a, it is easy to, to have a low carbon footprint. It just takes small steps. So fortunately, I was pretty successful and I was on Channel 7 on Sunrise to talk about my low power bill. And um, on the one, on the right, I was in all the, um, in the Telegraph and, and the Australian in the um, business section about my low power bill. And I wrote about my low power bill. And these are the signs that I have in my surgery room so that um, I can talk to my patients about it too. But as an individual, we can only go so far. Individual actions are important, but to be effective, we have to act as a collective. And these are my friends from the various groups I'm a member of. Uh, so I joined Citizens Climate Lobby first, and then Doctors for the Environment. I started community education, so I would give public talks. This was about air pollution to the public. This is in Newtown Town Hall talking about air pollution. With my two groups, Doctors for the Environment and Citizens Climate Lobby, we, we met with politicians and talked about climate change and air pollution. And this is just a smattering of politicians. We saw numerous. And I support, you support the politicians who would, who actually advocate for the things you care about. And in this case was Karen Phelps during the Wentworth by-election. We actually met with every single candidate, but I worked in Karen's campaign at the end. Now, the other way we can actually bring climate change to more politicians is the parliamentary friends groups. Now, every single parliament all over the world have parliamentary friends groups. Australia has about 100 of them. There was parliamentary friends of asthma, of every single code of football, of for coal export, but there wasn't a parliamentary friends for climate action. So in Citizens Climate Lobby, our secondary ask each time we saw a politician was to ask them 
to form a parliamentary friends of climate action. In order to form a par uh, parliamentary friends group, you need to have two co-conveners from two different parties. In this case, it was Karen Phelps in, in the purple and Rebecca Sharking from the Centre Alliance in the red. And once you actually have a parliamentary friends group, you can actually have whole functions within Parliament House and then invite other politicians. So you can have education sessions for all politicians with your parliamentary friends group. We also did lobbying within political parties. This is at the Labour Party conference, and this is my group, the Doctors for the Environment. So the advantage of this was that we could actually speak to all members of the Labour Party about climate change during that conference. This is our campaign, No Time for Games, protecting children in the health, uh, children's health in a changing climate. And the primary goal of this campaign was also to engage other doctors, as well as the wider community, to actually advocate for climate change. And this is me door knocking with um, the Nature Conservation Council, because door knocking is an effective way to actually send your message. And this is me at the Sopadani um, action. So Adani is a coal mine that is still in the process of um, we're working on in order to stop the process of it being going ahead. And this is at, this is in December, January, during the bushfires when the Prime Minister had gone on a holiday. So this is the action by Australian Parents for Climate Action and the school strikes. And the effective thing about that action was that we actually had a lot of media about climate change and also communicated the fact that we don't actually have a framework to deal with climate change in Australia for health and that we continue to burn and mine and export fossil fuels, which is driving our crisis. And these are further articles related to that uh, action. I've just put this in because I love Jane Goodall and this was the thrill of my life being on a panel with her at Macquarie University. And this is another action during the May elections where I carried this sign with Alice on the right on the stethoscope, who's with the Climate and Health Alliance and we saw every single politician with an open letter from 20 different health groups about acting on our climate emergency. And this is during the school strike. This is the, another action that we were involved with. It was organised by SEED, which is uh, associated with the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. There are plans to frack gas in the Northern Territory. And so besides the action in front of the um, AGM, we also went to the AGM and these are the directors of Origin Energy. And it's the first time I've actually been to an AGM of a fossil fuel company. It is quite amazing how cold they are to facts about the damage that coal, uh, the fossil fuels are having in terms of the heat, the rising heat in the Northern Territory. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and this is another action regarding gas. And these are my friends who actually have com combined to actually act, um, talk about coal, who sat in front of the coal mine to stop the trucks. Now, we know that at the moment we have rising emissions. And although thermal coal, many people understand thermal coal causes a high emissions level, not many people understand that gas potentially could be worse than coal. We know that gas through its lifetime is 80% has higher 
emissions are more 80% more potent over a 20 year period than coal. And at the moment, with our COVID commission, and who are the people who are deciding on how we transition out of this corona crisis, are very focused on having gas as the fuel. And we know from studies overseas that the prices of fossil fuels have gone down in terms of as, as an investment. And we know that the investment potential for clean energy has gone up. Now, at this point in time, we have the opportunity during the corona crisis to have a transformative change for a healthier future. I love this photo of my children and their friends because this is why I'm, I am in this climate space because this is their future. We can taste climate change now and feel it with the heat and the smoke. If something is not done about climate change now, and we actually wean from fossil fuels and transform to cleaner sources of energy, in the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to have rising heat. And this will make it almost uninhabitable and uninsurable parts of Northern Australia. I don't want my children and their friends to grow up in a place that is so hot and polluted. And this is why I am advocating every single day to do something about climate change. And this is the most recent thing that we've done. Uh, Doctors for the Environment has contacted all the other colleges in, uh, of medicine and we've written a letter to Scott Morrison to tell him to consider the need to actually have a healthy recovery and not a gas fueled one. So we have the Australian Medical Association, the College of General Practice, Physicians, Emergency Medicine, Intensive Care, Rural and Remote Medicine, College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the Psychiatrists, the Australian Medical, Medical Students Association, all united to ask the government to have a healthy recovery. So what can we all do in terms of advocacy? We can live sustainably and talk about it with influence our friends and families to do the same. Letter writing is undervalued and it's such an important thing to do. If, if you want to have the attention of your um, politician, if you actually email them, and there are a lot of emails, they'll take notice. If you handwrite a letter, it stays on their desk. And because politicians don't receive many handwritten letters, it makes more of an impact. You can join a group. And this uh, climate crisis requires all of us to work collectively. It's easy to join a rally or a strike or an action. There is plenty of training ar around now for political lobbying at the local, state and federal level. And there have been so many councils within Australia that have now declared a climate emergency. There there's training for lo lobbying corporations and attending the AGM. And, what, and to educate your peers once you feel comfort comfortable enough to and support the politicians who advocate for your passion. Or like my friends, um, protest at the pointy end and sit in front of coal mines. You can actually look at what you, you, how you bank and where your future is, where your super is. So at the moment, the Bendigo Bank and Bank Australia are, are the only two banks that don't invest in fossil fuels in Australia. And there's, there's Future Super, which is the only super that currently doesn't invest in fossil fuels. And more um, super funds are now actually divesting from thermal coal. And this is a list of organisations that you can potentially join. So besides the medical groups, there is um, the Australian Parents for Climate Action, there's Climate for Change, and there's Extinction Rebellion. And um, there's also numerous groups 
And I'm sure the Uniting Church can actually explain that too. And this is my group, uh, the doctors, doctors for the Environment at the last school strike. And we, we have to act now for a cleaner, healthier future. Okay. Good, that's the end, Emma. Brilliant. All oh, right. Well, that's a bit boring. It was a bit weird. No, but... no, no. I, I was, I'm just going to stop recording now.